The old man brought flowers to his wife's grave every day. But one day he found a letter there that changed his life. A gray, damp veil of autumn fog hung over the cemetery, barely touching the ancient gravestones as if trying to hide them from prying eyes. Wet leaves rustled softly beneath the feet of 69-year-old John Travolta, who slowly approached his wife's grave. Each step echoed in his heart, a heavy and relentless reminder of the days gone by. He stopped at the grave, gazing at the darkening stone with his wife's name engraved in neat letters. The stone seemed like the only bright spot in this somber place where old trees bowed their heads in mournful silence. The surrounding tombstones were covered in moss and worn by time, each telling its unique story of departed lives. John remembered how he and his wife Kelly once walked through this cemetery, holding hands. They joked about wanting to be here forever together, but now those words felt like a cruel irony of fate. A mask of sadness was fixed on John's face, the wrinkles seemed deeper with each passing day, and his eyes had lost their former sparkle. Amidst the silence and solitude, in this realm of final farewells, John felt his heart fill with pain and emptiness that nothing could now silence or fill. Yet, at the same time, deep down, he knew he had to keep living. To live for his children, Ellie and Benjamin, who needed his strength and love. But at that moment, standing by the grave, he allowed himself to momentarily loosen the grip he held in public, locking away his true feelings. Only here could he permit himself to feel the fatigue, sadness, and loneliness he had long concealed from everyone. Here, among the silent witnesses of departed lives, he could afford to be weak, to be a person who loses, suffers, and loves. Kelly had been everything to him, his wife, the mother of his children, his inspiration, partner, and friend. She provided warmth in their home, was always tidy, followed various diets, yet forgave John when he and their son raided the fridge at night. They had been married for nearly 30 years, and losing her was simply unbearable. His tears had long since dried, leaving only an indelible pain and emptiness. He had once been a handsome man. Women around the world adored him. But now he resembled a gray, stooped old man, with only a little time left before joining her in a grave of his own. I brought your favorite flowers, his voice barely held the pain, and each word felt like a knife cutting through his heart. He gently placed the bouquet on the cold marble, as if afraid to disturb her rest. Why did you leave so soon, John whispered, and those words echoed in his soul. Tears streamed down his cheeks, mixing with the raindrops that had begun to fall, as if the sky shared in his grief. He ran his hand over the gravestone, recalling every happy moment they had shared and every promise they hadn't fulfilled. The world seemed empty and meaningless without her, and he could not come to terms with her sudden loss. In John's memory, vivid scenes from his life with Kelly surfaced like bright but distant lights. He first met her on a film set, where she instantly captivated him with her spontaneity and liveliness. She was like a whirlwind that had swept into his orderly life, young, beautiful, with a gentle smile that never left her face. Her hair shimmered in the sunlight with shades of gold, and her eyes resembled a clear summer sky. He recalled her in that very way on New Year's Eve in Switzerland, when, amidst the chimes of the clock and the bursts of fireworks, he knelt and proposed to her. Kelly said yes with such enthusiasm and joy that the world around them seemed merely a faint reflection of their love. They could have married at any time, but instead, they first went on a honeymoon to the Caribbean, where, amidst the warm sea waves, the whisper of palm trees, and the soft caress of the breeze, they conceived their first child. Those days were filled with tenderness and carefree joy, and their love felt endless. Upon their return, they had a wedding in Paris, a city that had become a symbol of their passion. However, upon returning to the U.S., they encountered a bureaucratic error that necessitated a second ceremony in Daytona Beach, Florida. This incident added a touch of comedy and lightness to their relationship, which had always been a part of their interactions. Years passed, but in his memories, Kelly remained as young and beautiful as on the day they first met. Her laughter, her carefree attitude, and her love for life made each day they spent together bright and unique. Now, standing at her grave, John realized how deeply he missed her, how he longed for her voice, her touch, her laughter. 
and although the pain of her loss was unbearable, he knew that through their children, a part of Kelly was still alive in this world. Now, if you could see me, you'd probably put two fingers in your mouth again. Remember how you did that at home when you saw me naked standing by the mirror and decided to shame me that way, the man said, smiling through his tears. Back then, I lost 11 extra pounds just to keep you liking me. The air was filled with the scent of fresh earth and late autumn flowers that John had planted by the grave. These flowers, like his memories, adorned this somber corner of the cemetery, making it something more personal than just a place of final rest. And remember Jetta, our firstborn. How I wish I could believe he's here with you now, his voice faltered and tears glistened in his eyes. How much sorrow we had to endure, illness, and even the death of our son. But you were always strong and supported me no matter what. John and Kelly's firstborn, Jet, suffered from a rare illness, Kawasaki Syndrome, which causes inflammation of the blood vessels. A tragic accident occurred when Jet was 16 years old while the family was vacationing in the Bahamas. On that dreadful morning, Jet went to the bathroom where he had another episode. He fell and hit his head. Despite efforts to save him, he passed away in the ambulance before reaching the hospital. The family was devastated by his loss and sought therapy for many years. John paused, allowing past emotions to intertwine with his current state of grief and loss, mingling with the warmth of memories. I'll come again tomorrow and tell you about our children. They miss you so much, and I miss you too. He continued. Ellie is finishing university, you know? She's so much like you, just as determined and talented. And Benjamin, he started playing football, and he's really good at it. Tears quietly streamed down his cheeks as he spoke about his children, his loss, and the impossibility of sharing these moments with Kelly. These moments at the grave were his way of keeping the connection with her. They had become a living thread that still held him to the world of the living. As John finished, he said goodbye to Kelly, stood up, and slowly walked along the narrow path between the graves, each step measuring the time until his next visit, when he could once again feel close to his beloved. These visits to the cemetery were his ritual, a way to remember and feel that the love they shared was still here with him, and every whisper of the wind and every ray of the setting sun. As he walked the familiar path to the cemetery exit, John continued to think of Kelly. In his thoughts, she came alive again, spirited, full of ideas and energy. Kelly was always the one who inevitably led to adventures. In every situation, it seemed she sought and found opportunities for action, even if it meant getting into trouble. For instance, before Kelly even got her driver's license, she borrowed her grandfather's car and went for a drive with one of her friends in search of adrenaline and excitement. The journey began like a dream, deserted roads, wind in their hair, and a sense of absolute freedom. In every moment of rebellion and exhilaration, they felt like the whole world was at their feet. However, this ecstasy quickly turned into horror when Kelly, overestimating her driving skills and underestimating the car's speed, failed to notice an approaching cliff. At the very last moment, as the car was almost flying off the edge, Kelly reflexively jerked the wheel and slammed on the brakes. The car flipped several times before coming to a stop, leaving them in shock and with a sense of wonder at what had just happened. Fortunately, both Kelly and her friend survived, though they were shaken by the experience. Immediately after the accident, realizing the gravity of her actions and the possible consequences, Kelly concocted a convincing story for her parents. She confidently claimed that she had tried to avoid a collision with a speeding truck that had suddenly veered into their lane. This story seemed plausible enough to deflect suspicion, and her parents believed her. Her resourcefulness and determination always impressed John, especially when she demonstrated them under the most unexpected circumstances. He remembered how, once as a child, she had remained calm and collected while lost in the maze-like streets of Beirut. Instead of panicking, little Kelly found a woman who worked at the American Embassy. With unshakable confidence and clarity, she told the woman the address of their hotel, which she had remembered as soon as their family checked in. It was a moment full of tension and fear, which she turned into a success story, returning to her tearful and frightened parents who were at a loss for what to think. 
Every step John took on the wet grass stirred memories of how Kelly turned every challenge into an adventure and every puzzle into an opportunity to prove her independence. She always found a way out of the most difficult situations, confirming that life with her was never boring. As John stepped through the cemetery gates, he recalled a day that could have been their last. It started as an ordinary day with the pleasant anticipation of a holiday. They were heading to Maine to celebrate Thanksgiving with their seven-month-old son, Jet. John, an experienced amateur pilot, decided to fly the plane himself. They took off on a clear but frosty morning as the sun was just beginning to pierce through the thin strands of mist. The flight was smooth and John had begun to relax at the controls when suddenly, out of nowhere, a commercial airliner appeared. It abruptly entered their airspace. Only seconds away from a potential collision, John reflexively yanked the yoke, performing a steep maneuver to avoid the crash. His heart stopped in his chest and adrenaline surged. Kelly screamed in fear, holding Little Jet close, who, oblivious, continued to play with his stuffed bear. The violent shaking and noise that followed felt like an endless nightmare. When the plane finally stabilized, John continued to fly with a focused expression, carefully checking all the indicators and instruments. Kelly, still trembling but trying to stay calm for their son, tried to catch John's gaze, seeking support in his eyes. But he was too concentrated on flying to notice her looks. In those moments, the fear of death gripped them both, but neither wanted to show their vulnerability. When they finally landed, John stepped out of the plane and took a deep breath of fresh air. Kelly followed him, carrying their son. They exchanged looks full of gratitude that it had ended safely and embraced in silence. The reality of a life where every day could be the last seemed more real to them than ever. This event became one of those moments forever etched in their memories, reminding them of the fragility of life and the importance of cherishing every moment spent together. When John entered his home, filled with the silence of the twilight evening, he was greeted by 12-year-old Benjamin. Standing at the threshold, the boy looked at his father with dark circles under his eyes and a hurt expression on his face. Where have you been? Benjamin asked, his voice trembling with tension. John paused, struggling to find the right words. He knew that his visits to Kelly's grave were a sticking point between him and his son. I went to see mom, John admitted reluctantly, feeling each word weigh heavily in the air between them. Benjamin flinched, his eyes filling with tears that reflected deep disappointment. Mom is dead, and you know it. There's just her mortal remains there. There's no point in going there every day. She's gone, she doesn't exist anymore, the boy shouted through his tears, his voice muffled by sorrow. John felt his heart clench with pain. He wanted to approach and hug his son, but Benjamin quickly turned and ran to his room. The loud slam of the door echoed through the house like the final chord in their family drama. Left alone in the hallway, John felt tears well up in his eyes. He slowly made his way to the kitchen, his steps heavy and uncertain. He took the kettle, filled it with water, and placed it on the stove. As the water began to heat up, John stared blankly through the kitchen window. What if she is still here? What if we were wrong? He whispered to himself. The thought that Kelly might be somewhere nearby gave him a sliver of comfort. I wish she were here again. He continued to talk to himself as the kettle slowly came to a boil. This moment of solitude in the quiet kitchen was filled with bitterness and hope mixed with a deep sense of loss. Despite Benjamin's despair, John could not let go of the belief that each of his visits to the cemetery was not just a tribute to her memory, but also an attempt to find a thread connecting him to Kelly in this merciless world of absence. The next day, John returned to the cemetery. He felt the crunch of fresh grass underfoot, and the morning breeze played in the branches of the old oaks, creating a soft melody of nature. Approaching Kelly's grave, John slowly knelt down, touched the cold stone, and began to speak softly, as if expecting her to hear him. This time, he told Kelly about their children. His voice trembled as he spoke of the little and big successes of Ellie and Benjamin, and how they were coping without her. You always said he would become an athlete, John said with a smile, and you were right. He's as determined as you were. 
Then, after a moment's hesitation, he described their evening meal, macaroni and cheese, which Benjamin especially loved, and a salad Ellie had learned to make from one of Kelly's recipes. You'd be proud of how she's keeping up your culinary traditions, he said with a faint smile. As he spoke about this, John felt his grief mix with a sense of comfort. He knew these conversations had no meaning in the usual sense, that there would be no reply, but it eased him to think that he was sharing these moments with Kelly, that she was here with him, even if hidden beneath the layer of earth. So much is happening, and I just want you to know that you're still a part of our lives, he finished quietly, placing a fresh bouquet of her favorite flowers on the grave. He sat there for a while, listening to the wind, thinking about the past days, until the sun began to rise higher, bathing the old gravestones in the golden light of the day. Months had passed since Kelly's death, but for John, time seemed to have stopped. Each morning, regardless of the weather, whether clear skies or gray rainy clouds, he put on his old coat and went to the cemetery. This daily routine had become his way of maintaining a connection with Kelly, a way to continue living despite the painful sense of loss. Arriving at the grave, John would usually sit on a small folding chair he kept under a tree near the cemetery. He would start a conversation with Kelly as if she were still with him. In these talks, he reminisced about the wonderful moments they had shared. He told her how Ellie had finally completed a project she had been working on for weeks and how Benjamin had won his first chess game and scored another goal. These stories were filled with details, fleeting joys, and pride in their children. John also shared his plans with his wife, which now seemed less important than before. He talked about how he planned to redesign the garden or how he wanted to paint the fence around the house. Each task and plan seemed to help him feel needed to maintain a sense of normalcy in his new and unfamiliar solitude. John had also taken up cooking, a passion they had shared. He talked about new recipes he had tried to master. Recently, he had learned to make Thai curry and French macarons, dishes that Kelly would probably have enjoyed. He described how he whisked cream, carefully selected spices to achieve the perfect flavor, and how sometimes it didn't turn out quite as he had planned. These moments spent by Kelly's grave were for John not just a way to cope with his grief, but also a way to share his life with her despite her absence. Each time he left, he would leave something symbolic on the grave, a small bouquet of her favorite flowers, a photo of their children, or a page from a cookbook. These small gestures helped him feel that Kelly was still a part of his world. Yet, he couldn't stop thinking about her, reminiscing about her remarkable nature and constantly marveling at the unconventional decisions she had made in her life. For instance, when Kelly aimed to climb the Hollywood career ladder, she soon faced an unexpected obstacle. Her real last name, Paltzis, proved difficult to pronounce. Some viewers, trying to pronounce her name, distorted it beyond recognition, sometimes even calling her Kelly Taz. This comic but irritating mishap did not help her success, and Preston realized that changes were necessary for career advancement. Deciding that a new surname might be the key to success, Preston thought about how to choose the right one. She came up with the idea of gathering a full room of colleagues and crew members on the set and asking them to have an impromptu brainstorming session. She asked everyone present to shout out surnames starting with P, hoping that among the many suggestions, she would find the perfect one. The room buzzed with excitement, and suggestions came pouring in one after another. Preston listened attentively to each option, trying to sense which one suited her best. When someone shouted, Preston, she felt a strange but pleasant sensation. It seemed like the name fit her perfectly. With a smile on her face and confidence in her eyes, she made her decision. Her stage name would henceforth be Kelly Preston. This change turned out to be fateful. The new pseudonym not only made life easier for her fans, but also brought luck in her career. Preston wore the name with pride, remembering the day on the set when she took a step toward her dream. And so one day, on one of those unremarkable days, John returned to Kelly's grave. But this time, there was a surprise waiting for him. Almost immediately, his attention was drawn to an unusual object that seemed out of place. On the cold granite of the gravestone lay a white envelope, neatly folded and unexpectedly clean, as if it had just been placed there. 
It was strange and a bit unsettling, as the place was secluded, and John rarely saw other visitors. He slowly picked up the envelope, his hands trembling slightly with a mix of anticipation and unease. The envelope felt warm to the touch, as if it had just been taken from a pocket. John looked around, but apart from the rustling leaves and the distant singing of birds, nothing disturbed the silence of the cemetery. With uncertainty but curiosity, he opened the envelope and extracted a letter. What he read in the letter made his heart stop for a moment. On glossy paper, written in uneven handwriting, were the following words. My dear and beloved John, I knew I would find you here, even after so much time has passed since my death. Your devotion has always been as clear as sunlight and has left an indelible mark on my heart. Although I have left this world, my love for you and our children remains unchanged and eternal. By finding a way to reach you, I want to remind you that you will never be alone. I am always with you, John. I watch over you, rejoice in your successes, and grieve with you. Don't let the sorrow of my loss overshadow the bright moments we shared together. Live fully and happily, as we once dreamed. Allow yourself to laugh and love again. I have left you a small gift, which I hope will bring you comfort and joy. Fulfill my last request. This evening, a table has been reserved in your name at the Island Way Grill. Wear that shirt I gave you, remember? At 7 p.m., a special person will be waiting for you there. I'm sure that, upon seeing them, you will understand everything immediately. With love, forever yours, Kelly. Tears, hot and silent, streamed down John's cheeks, dripping onto his pale hands like tiny crystals of grief. His heart, torn apart by the overwhelming emotions, beat so hard it seemed like each pulse was ready to burst through. With trembling hands, filled with deep love and boundless sorrow, he carefully, almost tenderly folded the letter. Every movement of his hands was full of tenderness, as if he was touching the most precious relic, and he returned it to the envelope. In his hands, he held not just paper but a final message from his beloved, which had become a bridge between the past full of happy moments and an uncertain future. He remembered how, while Kelly was still alive, they both worked diligently on their relationship, like sculptors crafting something wonderful from the mundane. Every conversation, every little detail was important. Communication is very important. Be playful. People destroy their own marriages. Therefore, you must always have fun, play, and organize dates, he recalled her words, which now sounded like a testament. Kelly always knew how to add color to their days. She would leave him amusing notes with promises of unforgettable nights, arrange little surprises, and romantic adventures that started from an ordinary morning and unexpectedly turned into thrilling journeys. Once, showing considerable ingenuity, she even arranged with John's producer about his shooting schedule to steal his evenings just for herself. Usually, they arrived at official events looking blissfully disheveled, their eyes glowing with joy and mutual satisfaction, as if they had just returned from their first and incredible date. Every moment spent together was a celebration for them, and every word of Kelly's in his memory now sounded like the sweetest melody. Slowly moving away from Kelly's grave, John made his way to the cemetery exit. His steps were heavy and uncertain, as if he bore the full weight of his grief on his shoulders. Not understanding how Kelly could have organized all this, not knowing in advance what he would do next or how to react to this unexpected letter, he still felt awe at her foresight and care. How could she have known that he would visit her every day and that on this very day, he would find this letter? It all seemed like a miracle, a mystery he might never fully unravel. He wondered who Kelly might have invited to meet him. It could have been anyone from a famous actor, a producer, a friend, to the President of the United States. John recalled that Kelly had attended Punahou School, which was not just an educational institution, but a true cradle of future celebrities. Among its alumni was one of the most famous people on the planet, former President Barack Obama. The school, steeped in the spirit of achievement and ambition, provided its students not only with knowledge, but also with inspiration for great deeds. Decades passed, and one day, Kelly's path crossed with Obama's again. It happened at a Grand Legends Ball organized by Oprah Winfrey herself. 
The hall was full of dazzling stars and influential figures, and Kelly happened to be next to Obama. Despite their shared school history, she did not recognize him. But the 44th president, with his phenomenal memory, smiled and confessed that he remembered her well from those campus days. I definitely remember seeing you around the school grounds, he said, reminiscing about moments from their school days. This acknowledgement, coming from one of the most influential people in the world, surprised and touched Kelly. In that brief but rich encounter, it was as if their past and present converged, highlighting how remarkably fates can intertwine on the path to greatness. That evening not only confirmed past success, but also symbolized how school years can leave an indelible mark on life, connecting people even decades later. Walking home through the cold, almost deserted streets, John reflected on his life with Kelly. She knew him better than he knew himself. She anticipated his need for support and love even after her death. She knew me far better than I ever could have guessed, he whispered to himself. These words, spoken aloud, filled him with a mix of longing and peace. When John entered the house, where every item reminded him of Kelly, he felt his soul fill with a quiet sadness mingled with gratitude. He realized that the letter was not just a memory, but a reminder that Kelly's love for him was still alive, that she continued to care for him even from another world. This message had changed him, altering his view of grief and loneliness. He now knew he was not alone on his path and that the love they shared continued to support, guide, and inspire him each new day. At home, John turned on the hot water and stepped into the shower, letting the warm water wash away the day's tension and the confusing mix of emotions that had enveloped him after reading the letter. After the shower, he felt somewhat renewed, ready to face whatever this evening's adventure had in store. He approached the wardrobe and carefully opened its door. On a hanger in the back was the shirt, the very one, simple yet exquisitely tailored. It had been a gift from Kelly on their last anniversary. He hadn't worn it since then, keeping it as a precious relic embodying the essence of their shared memories. Gently taking the shirt in his hands, he brought it to his face. The fabric was soft, and it seemed as if the faint scent of her perfume, those very ones Kelly had worn in the final months of their life together, still lingered in the air. The barely perceptible fragrance instantly transported him back to those carefree moments when they were together and happy. As he smoothed out the shirt's fabric, each movement of his hands reminded him of Kelly's touches. In his imagination, she came to life again, and he caught the sincere look with which she had given him this gift. John's heart ached with the bitterness of loss, but at the same time, he felt a deep gratitude for the moments of joy they had shared. He put on the shirt, buttoned it up carefully, and looked at himself in the mirror. Where are you going? asked the surprised Benjamin when he saw his father meticulously adjusting the collar of the shirt. I have a meeting at a restaurant tonight. Your mom, she asked me to go there today, John replied calmly, meeting his son's gaze through the reflection in the mirror. Mom's dead, dad, exclaimed his son, bewildered. Have you completely lost your mind? She couldn't have asked you to go somewhere today. She could, John replied quietly, stepping away from the mirror and handing Benjamin the white envelope. Still skeptical, Benjamin took the letter and examined the handwriting carefully. Yes, it does look like her handwriting. She was always so unpredictable, he smiled, as if recalling some inside jokes they used to share with their mom. Seeing Benjamin's face darken as he read the letter, John approached him and gently placed a hand on his shoulder. Thank you, son. I'm sure mom's surprise for me will be as pleasant as always, he said softly, feeling tears well up in his son's eyes. Yes, she always knew how to surprise us. And it seems like even now she's found a way to do it, John whispered, trying to ease the tension. Finishing the letter, Benjamin suddenly jumped up, trying to hold back his emotions. All right, dad, it's time for you to go, or you'll be late. Don't keep mom waiting, even if it's just her last surprise for you. Their final embrace was warm and strong, filled with love and understanding, like a bridge between the past and the future that Kelly had so elegantly helped to build, even in her absence. John arrived at the Island Way Grill restaurant, feeling a mix of excitement and nervous anticipation. The evening was warm, and a gentle breeze played with the palm leaves at the entrance. 
As he walked in, a smiling waiter greeted him and led him to the reserved table by the window, which offered a view of the shimmering bay waters. John's heart raced in anticipation. Who will come? Who did she invite? He wondered, adjusting his shirt and sitting with his back to the entrance. His gaze nervously scanned the arriving guests. Time seemed to drag incredibly slowly. John thought again of Kelly, how she lived, and how she left. Taking a deep breath, he recalled the day Kelly told him about her diagnosis. It was a peaceful evening at their home when she took his hand and, looking into his eyes, gently informed him of her breast cancer. She wanted to fight and keep it a secret from everyone to protect her family from public scrutiny. John remembered how the news of Kelly's illness shocked him. How he felt devastated, yet overwhelmed with a desire to be her support. After receiving this news, John took on the role of not only a husband, but also Kelly's primary helper and defender in her battle with the disease. He learned to cope with the emotional highs and lows that inevitably accompanied the long months of treatment. Each visit to the oncology center was a trial for both of them, but John always tried to remain optimistic and support Kelly. He held her hand during procedures, made jokes to lift her spirits, and was there for both big and small victories over the illness. His unwavering presence by Kelly's side helped her feel less alone and isolated by her condition. John was also actively involved in discussions with doctors, striving to understand every aspect of the treatment and its potential effects. He became a true expert in breast cancer treatment matters, doing everything he could to make informed decisions with Kelly. Unfortunately, despite their combined efforts and hopes, the illness continued to progress. In the final months, when it became clear that the outcome was inevitable, John focused on making each day filled with love and care. They spent their time together reminiscing about their long life together, joyful moments, and planning to make their remaining time as comfortable and peaceful as possible. Sadly, despite the doctor's efforts and her indomitable will, the disease continued to advance. Kelly passed away on the morning of July 12, 2020, leaving behind not only sorrow, but also a bright memory of her love and care, which she generously shared with everyone around her. When Kelly passed, John felt a deep emptiness, but at the same time, he felt gratitude for the years they spent together and for the chance to be with her in her final moments. His love and support were invaluable during those difficult times, and he continued to carry that love in his heart, helping his children cope with the loss of their mother. On the day of Kelly's death, John posted on his Instagram, With a very heavy heart, I am letting you know that my beautiful wife Kelly lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought bravely with the love and support of so many people. My family and I will always be grateful to her doctors and nurses at the Anderson Medical Center, all the medical centers that helped, and her numerous friends and loved ones who were by her side. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. I will take time to be with my children who have lost their mother, so please forgive me in advance if you don't hear from us for a while. But please know that I will feel your outpouring of love in the coming weeks and months as we heal. At that moment, the restaurant door opened again, pulling John from his sorrowful memories. A middle-aged woman in an elegant dark blue dress walked in. Her piercing gaze and confident stride made it clear she was not just a guest, but someone whose presence immediately commanded attention. She approached John's table and introduced herself as Dr. Helena Voss, a geneticist. John, I apologize for the unexpected appearance, she began, smiling. I knew your wife, Kelly. She was not only my patient, but also actively involved in one of our most ambitious projects. John felt his heart skip a beat. He thought he knew everything about Kelly. He looked at Dr. Voss, eagerly hanging on every word she spoke. Kelly helped us develop a new method for early detection of genetic predispositions to breast cancer, Dr. Voss continued. She was not just a sponsor, she was the inspiration for our entire team. Dr. Voss pulled a folder with documents from her briefcase, showing data that could now save thousands of lives through early detection. But that's not all, she said, looking into John's eyes. Kelly left a message that I was to deliver to you personally. Dr. Voss's words made John's heart pound even harder. She handed him an envelope with Kelly's name on the back. 
With trembling hands, he unfolded the paper, which contained his wife's final words. John, I know that my struggle was hard not only for me, but also for you. I wanted you to know that every moment spent together was a gift to me. I love you and will always be with you, even if you don't see me. I hope my legacy helps make the world a better place. Tears welled up in John's eyes. He clutched the letter, feeling each of Kelly's words filling him with meaning and purpose. What can I do? He asked, looking at Dr. Voss. Kelly wanted you to continue her work, she said. She dreamed of creating an educational program that would teach people about understanding their health at a genetic level. You could help realize her vision. John nodded, feeling a mixture of bitterness and determination. I will do everything I can to make her dream a reality, he said firmly. That evening truly marked the beginning of a new chapter in his life, one filled with dedication and a new mission inspired by Kelly's love and her unwavering faith in science and progress. This meeting not only opened his eyes to the significance of the research Kelly had supported, but also gave him the opportunity to continue her fight and help change the lives of many people.